It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. I want to spend a little time talking about my good fortune uh, and and really express how grateful I am for being able to lead the American dream, live what I thought never possible as a child. Uh, in our household the last 18 hours, uh, we've had a little chaos. Uh, my oldest daughter took ill, um, you know, called the house. Hey, what, what should I do? Immediately, my wife, without missing a beat, go to the ER. Get there as soon as you can. I'll meet you there. Turns out she needed her appendix removed. Got there, you know, plenty of time. Uh, unlike when my son's appendix burst, uh, she got there in time. Uh, they, we had to wait a little bit. It was a little chaotic, you know, getting into the surgery and all that. But got the surgery done. Half hour, in and out. Simple. And I want to thank the uh, uh, the ER staff. I want to thank the, the doctors, the nurses, the support people, everyone at the Carlisle Regional Hospital in my neighborhood uh, who took just incredible care of my daughter in, in this moment of, of potential crisis in this moment of of you know she wasn't well uh needed needed their professional uh help and got it and, and i'm grateful for that but here's the thing and this is where i come back to i never for a moment my wife never for a moment she never for a moment worried about was she going to be able to pay for the the health care she was getting was this going to bankrupt her uh was it going to bankrupt us and, and for that, you know, I thank my union. I am grateful to my union for providing our family through collective bargaining the best health care that you can get in this country, the best health insurance to get us the best care when we need it. Without, and this is the important part of this, without worrying, hey, is this going to break us? Without worrying, oh, do I, do I need you know, pre-approvals, pre-authorization, do I need you know, all of the stuff, all of the roadblocks that sadly far too many working people are saddled with. So for that, I am grateful to my Teamsters Union for fighting for and negotiating and, and us winning what is the best health insurance you can possibly get in my view. Uh, it's not going to break us. And the thought never, never popped into our head. I'm also thankful to Barack Obama. Thank you, President Obama, for getting the ACA passed that allowed my 21-year-old daughter to remain on our health insurance while she finds her path, while she's finding her way in life. This one, this one minor illness, this one setback could have bankrupted her because she has a job that doesn't offer health insurance. Uh, while she's trying to figure out what she wants to do and where she wants to go, she's working for an employer that doesn't give her benefits. And look, uh, she's worried that she's going to lose that job because she's an at-will employee in an at-will state. She's worried about the loss of pay. Is she going to be able to, to make, make her car payment? Is she going to be able to put food on the table? Now, fortunately, she has a support system. I am not going to allow her to not have food on the table. Um, you know, we own the house she lives in, so rent I'm not worried about. She's fortunate. And, and look, we're fortunate because I've had a union job that has afforded me the ability to come out of poverty myself and build for not just for me, but for my children, opportunities. And for me, this is, this is one, of those, one of those really grateful moments because I know because I've heard so many stories of something like this causing utter chaos in most people's lives. A, a, an illness destroying families. And, and for me, it comes back to how do we create a society where everyone is able to weather a storm or multiple storms? Look, in my lifetime, these roadblocks have happened. 
like I'm sure in everyone else's lifetime, there are obstacles in the way. But having the security of knowing, you know what, if it's a health event, I'm going to get the care I need. And it's not going to break me. What was interesting is, you know, even in these environments, the first question that these hospitals are asking is, where's your insurance information? While she's writhing in pain, can you pay us? And for me, again, being fortunate and grateful, I, I, I want that for everyone. I know it's easy to go, you know, I've got it and hooray for me and the heck with you. But no one... And I was thinking about this today as I was, you know, watching my daughter sleep coming out of recovery, going, my only concern is that she gets better. My only thought is what can we do to make her pain go away, to make her better so that she can go on and lead the rest of her life. And that this just be a memory, that this not be a defining moment of her life, that we end up losing your job, filing bankruptcy, being homeless, things that happen to people because of one one illness now we're waiting to see what happens with with her job clearly don't know but i'm fully expecting that there won't be a job waiting for her in the three four five weeks down the road that it's going to take to recover uh to get her the kind of 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 release uh to go back to work to lifting you know 20 30 40 pounds or whatever it is that she does Someone will fill that space for that company and, well, she'll just fall off the list. And this, again, is the difference between a union company with a contract where you maintain your seniority rights and a non-union at-will employee that can just say, well, you know, we don't need you. Uh, Or we've cut your hours down to virtually nothing, so you're not fired. You just don't get any hours. I mean, we didn't fire you. You're just not working here which isn't firing, it's just not working you. <laughs> which is the same, seems like you know some, some linguistic gymnastics, but still the same. People lose their paychecks. People lose their ability to put food on the table. And, and, and as I was thinking about this today, because I had a lot of time to sit and think, because uh, when you're sitting in the ER, when you're sitting you know, in, in, the, in the waiting room, in the recovering room, and you're just sitting, uh, the mind goes in a lot of places, and, and I come back to how fortunate I am and how grateful I am that I've been allowed and been able to build a, a bit of, of economic freedom, to have the, the liberty, if you will, that I can withstand a, a, bit, of, a bit of chaos, and not just for myself, but for my children. You know, someone said, oh, it's good, good on you for being, for being here with her. And I'm going, where else would I be? I took a day off work because I had to be there with her. As every parent I know wants to be, but most can't. And this comes back to, and, and this again is where my mind is, as a working class, as a culture, Shouldn't this be what we're fighting for for everyone? Shouldn't this be what we're working toward? Not just more profit for corporate America, not just more for them and less for us, but for more opportunities. Not not the fact that we, we live just to work, but the fact that our work pays for our lifestyle, pays for us to live and also help our children. So I, I guess I just wanted to start today by be, by being thankful, uh, not just to my union, but also to President Obama for, for getting the ACA passed, for putting this in there to make sure that, that she has this, this safety net. Uh, and not only that our family was able to provide, but that our insurance provides as well. But I come back to, we should be fighting for this, not just the Smith household, but for every household. That every person who plays by the rules and works hard has a real shot. So that, that's where I want to start. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Eric Loomis is going to be here to share some thoughts on a 34-hour work week, the history of the eight-hour day, and, well, you know, our greed class. And maybe how we build a society where workers do have economic freedom. 
Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Right back. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So recently we talked about how our billionaire class saw their wealth grow by 88% over the four years of the pandemic. Uh, and then, then we see the largest U.S. corporations seeing their profits skyrocket by 63% over those same four years. And oh, by the way, uh, with that, that profit, they bought a record $681 billion in stock back, you know, so they could pump up their CEO pay, which again has made the gap between CEO and worker pay even wider while paying historically low uh, tax rates. Oh, oh, and there's more. There's more. Uh, in fact, corporate profits hit a new all time record in the fourth quarter of 2023, but we can't raise the minimum wage or even talk about how we're going to make workers' lives better. We can't talk about maybe uh, shortening the work week so workers take advantage of the productive gains that their, their labor is producing. No, no, that would be bad for profit. And I keep asking, when do we wake up as working people and say, um, we're getting the short end of the stick here? Uh, now, as we talked about not too long ago, good on the UAW for bringing up the idea of a 32-hour work week. But wow, some of the ideas that came out after, quite amusing and scary. And I got to tell you, you know, reminiscent of 100 years ago when they were fighting for the eight-hour day under the banner of eight hours for work, eight hours for rest. Oh, yeah, and eight hours for whatever the heck we want. And here to share some thoughts on, you know, what it took. And I got to tell you, newfound Newfound respect for those people in the past who fought for what we take take for granted. I've asked our good friend Eric Loomis to come talk with us. A history professor, lawyers, guns and money blogger, and author of one of the most important books you must read, A History of America and Ten Strikes. Eric, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, yeah, you bet. I'm real glad to be here. So, you know, I got to tell you, I'm looking at all these numbers. Uh, corporate profit high, billionaire class making huge money, CEOs going through the roof, but still, still haven't raised the minimum wage. And oh, when the UAW said, you know, maybe we should shorten the work week as automation and robotics and all this stuff come online, maybe we should benefit a little bit from it. I got to tell you, some of the responses, quite, quite crazy. Well, I think that it... it we have in, in sort of like imbibed um, the idea of, of of that the situation at work is like as good as it's ever going to get, right? That it could never get better. That um, that to even consider such a thing is basically I don't know communism or something, right? That it's it's just like totally out of uh, uh, totally out of control. Um, the reality is that even when the forty hour work week was created and was won by most, but not all workers in the late 1930s, there were plenty of people who wanted and demanded and, and fought for even lower weeks. And it wasn't just, you know, crazy leftists either. Um, really as late as the 1960s, even the 1970s, uh, people were talking about this because of the massive increase in productivity, uh, because of automation, um, because the nation seemed to be getting wealthier and wealthier. Um, and so the idea that the 40 hour work week is like this, this thing that just can't be touched um, doesn't really make any historical sense. 
I think rather it's a sign that we've really lost a lot in terms of the ways in which we conceptualize how, how to make change in this country. I'm right there with you. But the thing that gets me is, you know, you know, when when I first started working, 40 hours was it. You know, the eight hour. I had someone tell me, can you believe they they want overtime after eight hours? And I'm going my entire work life. That's what I've demanded. I don't know how we lost it. But when I started working, that was the norm. And in most union contracts, that's the norm. How did we get away from that? I still am trying to figure out. Well, you mean how do we get away from overtime? No, how do we get away from people you know, saying eight hours is enough? I, I understand. Okay, I understand. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a couple of things there happened. One um, is that the, uh, the buying power of Americans went flatlined in the 1970s, right? And so, you know, if people wanted the newest things, the, 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 you know, the new truck, the TV, um, all of the amazing consumer goods that uh, have developed on the market in the last half a century, over time became a way to do that, right? Because your eight-hour contract, even in a union contract, was not going to make you enough money for that for rising levels of consumption, right? So ever since the early 70s, almost all of the increased productivity uh, and that profit has been captured by employers. Everyday workers, their salaries have completely flatlined in the, in the last half a century, right? The buying power of American workers is pretty much the same as it was in 1973. Um, and over time is what kind of caught up to that. Um, I think that the other side of that, that problem is that... Um, is that the idea of work as something that was in some ways regrettable or in some ways, you know, something you had to do, but you certainly weren't going to do more of it than you needed to. I think that really under, underwent a pretty significant propaganda campaign uh, that went around with the same time as the decline of, of unions in this country, that um, the idea that work is better or work, working more means more commitment to the job uh, really took over. Um, you see the decline of 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 uh, hourly work and so much of that work, especially in the white collar, transitioned into salaried work, which really is just another way to exploit you. Right. Because you lose that hourly wage and you now you just have a bunch of work that you have to do. And if you're expected to work 10, 11 hours a day, then that's what a lot of people do. And I don't think it was really until the pandemic that anybody began to question this. And, and I think a lot of what we're seeing in the last uh, three or four years uh, it was a result of the pandemic and people once again questioning their relationship with work. No, and that's an excellent point, you know, because, you know, what's amazing to me is, uh, you know, I've been I've been complaining about wages being flatlined, standard of living declining, uh, wages being eroded by inflation over the last 40 years. I've been complaining about that for you know over a, you know, almost two decades. And now since the, the pandemic, you've seen a lot more people complaining that, well, my wages haven't kept up. Like it's something new, like they're, you know, they're Magellan discovering new territory, when the reality is this has been 40 years in the making. And I, I guess better late than never to wake up to it. Uh, so do you think this anger translate into some, some positive gain, or is it just anger for anger's sake to, uh, well, to go after politicians? I don't think so. I, 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 I'm fairly positive about this. Um, you know, I don't think that this anger uh, just disappears. You know, I mean, it is, you know, again, as you point out, a lot of people, yourself, myself, many other people have been pointing this out for a very long time. Um, but you never know what's going to wake people up. And I think that's one lesson of social movements, right? You'd like to think that if you combine this and that, that something happens and people wake up and they begin to act again. But it doesn't really work that way. And it's kind of a mystery in some ways. I and mean, all you can do is present the information, try to get people to organize. And eventually, some for, for whatever complex reasons, it actually begins to happen. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing here, right? Um, you know, we'll see what happens with these UAW elections in the South. But, you know, that would be a really potentially transformative moment. Um, Starbucks actually uh, getting real union negotiations, I think, is a really positive thing. And, and, and I think that the general belief that work is something, again, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is not always a good thing it has really, I, I think, began to once again rise in people's heads that there are economically dissatisfied. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the 80s, the 90s and, and really until the 2008 housing crisis was a period of pretty much untrammeled capitalist propaganda where both political parties were promoting a lot of the same ideas about growth and who drove growth and who should benefit from growth. And there was a lot of conversation about, you know, everyday people, uh, 
they would benefit from this growth if they worked really hard, but it didn't really work out that way, right? Again, yeah. the, the employer took all of the money. And so I, I think there's just been this slowly building anger and now we're really seeing it begin to make, I think, positive gains. Yeah, it was supposed to trickle down, if I remember right. It was going to be like manna from heaven. It just never seemed to make it down, at least down to uh, to the average working person. So in looking back to, you know, as I've, I've said, I have a newfound respect for people of the past who fought for things like the eight-hour day, fought for the collective bargaining rights that that we still somewhat have. Um I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I've new, newfound respect. So what lessons do we learn from the past to maybe help uh, this generation achieve something that we're going to pass on to future ge- generations so that maybe they can take it for granted? Well, I think that you have to center class and work in your existence. Um, I think for a long time in a whole lot of America, and, and I still think that that's true, um, people might give a passing sentiment or discussion of class, but they don't really identify that way. And I, I'm not talking about just academics who maybe you're writing um, about other things other than class, um, you know, and focusing on sexuality or something like that, all of which has value. But I'm also talking about everyday people who had forgotten they were working class and were voting for, you know, right-wing politicians over abortion or other culture war things. Um, and and I think that it, what, we've, what we could see in the past is that if you center class as a serious category of your identity um, and you take it as seriously as you do take your religion or whatever else that that can really lead to solidarity, right? Can lead to building actual relationships with people who aren't necessarily like you, but are in fact working class people um, and begin to move towards some collective action that overcomes some of these other differences and begins to uh, understand the world in a way that we all share something in common, which is um, the ex- uh, our exploitation by the bosses. Um, so, so and, and I think that, you know, the old workers of 100 or 150 years ago, they, they had their problems. They weren't heroes. Uh, you know, they had all kinds of issues. But they did understand this. They did understand that class mattered. And they operated on that, uh, on that, that framework. And they fought and sometimes died for something, for things that we completely take for granted today, like the eight-hour day, collective bargaining, uh, the end of child labor, things like this. No, I, I often say you know, my grandparents' generation, you know, they fought and fought, bled and died for uh, the most prosperous working class in history. Um, and they didn't always get along. Look, they, they you know, some of the stories my grandfather told were, were not everyone kumbaya on the same page, but they all understood that their economic interests overlapped. And that's what that's what was important. This is why I've been saying for a while that this is the area where we could in this moment unite this country around the idea that that economic freedom is what we should be fighting for. All of that other stuff that, that keeps being thrown out to divide us. That's just noise. It's economic freedom we should be fighting for. Well, you know, it's 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 interesting you you say that because in so much of our rhetoric um, in this propaganda that we have been inundated with for our entire lives, the idea of economic freedom is really about you know the way that's used is the freedom of the capitalist to make as much money as possible and kind of return us back to those bad old days. But if you look back at, you know, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued the Four Freedoms uh, after or right at the end of World War II, and he was kind of articulating what the future should look like. And it wasn't the freedoms that he was articulating were not this kind of hyper individualized ideas that tend to define what freedom means. Today. You know, the freedom to have an AR-15 or whatever. The freedoms were collective freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom from want. Right. That we together were going to work to create a society in which people were not starving. Right. And we never quite got there. But we did, as you point out, have the most uh, successful and powerful working class in American history in those years. And then, honestly, we just gave it away. Right. We just decided to give it away. Uh, And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. And it's a complicated issue. But, you know, it's one of the real difficulties of dealing with say uh, the late 20th century is the ways in which Americans just kind of chose to give that, give this away. And uh, here we are having now to fight to both retain the scraps of what we did have that we still have at least a little bit and then regain everything that we've lost. 
No, you're absolutely right. And I've been saying for the longest time, the Republicans are trying to repeal the 20th century yes. and all of the prosperity for working people that came with it and return us to the good old days of the 80s and 90s and not the 1980s and 90s. Uh, so I, I guess where I want to finish this up is, you know, is there is there something we can glean from the past where we go, this is our, again, this is the marching order uh, that, that people can grab onto? Because I'm with you. I think that given what the UAW is doing and, and you know spending a lot of resources to organize places that really haven't uh, been, been you know on the table, uh, and th those could be transformative, but other unions getting out and doing the same thing can, I think, reunite this country in a way that I've been wanting to see for a very long time. So, so any thoughts as we wrap up? Well, I think you have to organize. I mean, you, you know, this it's almost a cliche to say that, but organizing takes real resources, right? And it takes a combination of organizations that have the know-how and the wherewithal and the resources to do it, combined with people who actually want to organize. And it's possible that right now we are seeing both of these things happen, right? We've certainly seen in the past people wanting to organize and, and organizations, including many unions, kind of just not really putting the effort into it. And we've seen attempts by unions to organize people, but then the, the, the workers themselves are divided. But I think so. I think that you have to you have to push for organizing both at the at the institutional level, but also at the grassroots level. Right. And that includes work and that includes rank and file members. It includes building solidarity at the workplace or in other parts of your life. And again, centering these ideas of class as a core identifying factor. And if, if both of those things happen, then the potential is absolutely there to to make that difference. And, you know. You go back to the 1930s and, and 40s, and that's really what was happening, right? You had big unions, you know, a lot of this organizing from the 30s funded by the mine workers. Um, and then you had millions of people who wanted to be organized. So it all kind of worked out. You know, the, you, so you, it kind of requires sort of two different things and you combine them together and the possibility exists. And I think that exists right now. And I also think this is where the politics comes in, into it. You have to have a political system that's going to going to back that up. And this is where yes. I think, you know, this is where I give the Biden administration credit. Uh, I like who they put at the NLRB and the Department of Labor and those things to help facilitate this organizing that's going on. Uh, I just wish we could do more of it. But again, this is why voting matters. And this is why I think coming back to this idea of of class is so very important, as you've articulated. Uh, but as always, Eric, I appreciate you taking time for us. Great stuff. Hope people check out the book, A History of America and Ten Strikes, a must read. Uh, Eric Loomis, thanks so much. Thank you again. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Do you agree? Is this how we bring America back together? Is this how we, I don't know, leave something for the future for our kids to actually want to inherit? Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Thanks for tuning in to The Rick Smith Show. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find all that and much more at the ricksmithshow.com. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. <laughs> So you may remember during the 2016 presidential election, it was all about when is Trump going to release his tax returns? Uh, in fact, during one of the debates, you know, he was asked about, you know, how little he pays and you know, how he avoids taxes and all that stuff, how he doesn't pay taxes and said he was uh, he was smart. And what was interesting is I, I found a lot of working people who are agreeing. Oh, yeah, he's smart. If he can avoid the taxes, I wouldn't pay taxes if I could. But I don't think they quite get just how much. Uh, now, we got a glimpse because a whistleblower released some of the taxes of, of people like Trump and Bezos and Musk uh, to see just how little they actually pay. And I kept saying, look, I don't think there's any real crimes in Trump's tax report returns, but I do think it would show us how little he pays and all of the loopholes that they've created for themselves to avoid taxes. And that's the dirty little secret they don't want us to know. Uh, which is why I thought it was interesting. There was a, a piece over at Slate Magazine, over at Slate.com that caught my attention uh, saying that, hey, you know, the Biden administration should pardon uh, this guy who was the whistleblower at the IRS who you know, kind of showed some of this stuff. Uh, and here to share some thoughts on why Biden should uh, should pardon this whistleblower. I've asked Kenny Stansel to come talk with us. Kenny's a senior researcher at the Revolving Door Project, revolvingdoorproject.org, the website. Kenny, thanks for taking time for us. 
Of course. Thank you for having me, Rick. So and uh, yeah, as you alluded to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I look. So why should Biden, uh, you know, release this guy? Why should he pardon him? And and what what sentence did he get for just pointing out that we've got rich people who aren't paying taxes? Yeah, let me start with the sentencing. It's really outrageous. Um, and one piece or one, you know, piece of information that got cut from the slate piece is I tried to condemn um, Attorney General Merrick Garland's Justice Department for seeking the maximum punishment against Little John. Uh, they they saw a five year sentence and that's what the judge gave him. Um, and it's really outrageous when you compare it to sentencing of um, well-connected, wealthy people just to take one example, uh, former Trump organization CFO Alan uh, Weisselberg is he's going to be sentenced next week for perjury. And New York prosecutors only saw a five month sentence <laughs> compared to five years. And that's after he spent 100 days in jail for uh, tax fraud. So, uh, yeah, they sought the maximum sentence. The judge made it clear that she was trying to, to, to deter other whistleblowers did not allow Little John to claim that he was acting in the public interest um, in his defense. And so, as you alluded to, it's thanks to Little John that we know exactly how little Trump, and not just Trump, but the billionaire class in general pays in taxes. And so, I think there are a few, a couple of reasons why Biden should, should pardon Little John. The first is there's just a really straightforward moral case and that is that what Charles Littlejohn did, um, it was really selfless and quite heroic actually, um, because he exposed um, the extent to which our country is being starved by these billionaire tax cheats. And like you said, um, a lot of the tax avoidance, it a lot of it's legal, um, but all that that conveys is that our tax code is extremely rigged. And the proper response to what Littlejohn revealed would have been to reform our tax code to make sure that billionaires aren't paying less than teachers and nurses, right? And um, so thanks to Little John, the New York Times and ProPublica did some really groundbreaking reporting. Um, the ProPublica piece in particular, it went through and, and told us what the true tax rates are. Um, just to give you a couple examples, Warren Buffett, 0.1% true tax rate. Uh, Jeff Bezos is just under 1%. Mike Bloomberg is just over 1%. Musk is around 3%. Um, another good example that just shows how rigged the tax code is in favor of the wealthy against the working class. There are people who work at sports stadiums who pay more in taxes than the billionaire sports teams team owners. And so again, a lot of this would have been, a lot of this information would have continued to be concealed if it hadn't been for Little John. Um, and so we think there's a moral case to pardon Little John. Um, you shouldn't let this 38 year old languish in prison for years for doing the public this huge service. Um, one more note about that is that, you know, in other countries, Nordic countries in particular, tax information is public and that level of transparency makes it much easier to hold um, oligarchs accountable or to prevent them from uh, amassing such a harmful concentration of wealth in the first place. Yeah. Accordingly, you know, it's not surprising why the U.S. ruling class uh, would prefer to keep that information secret. Um, so Little John, you know, he really, it was a sort of the emperor has no clothes moment. He exposed um, this really these really embarrassing facts about tax injustice. So the first thing is there's moral reasons to pardon Little John. But in addition, we think that it would be really good politics for Biden to do this. Um, you know, I made the mistake of venturing into the comment section on the Slate article and a little bit on Reddit. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> and, no, I should. I did, but I should not have. And I quickly, you know, got away. But I noticed, you know, some people were saying, oh, it was almost like they were buying into that. Like, you know, every time that Trump is, is being prosecuted, he says, this is a witch hunt. The, you know, they're weaponizing the DOJ against me. And, some people seem to buy into that logic and were saying like it would be a mistake for Biden to, um, you know, pardon somebody who targeted his political opponent. But just to push back on that, there's one really clear reason why that that counter argument doesn't make sense. And that is that Little John didn't just expose Trump's right. uh, tax records. He exposed, you know, 
a, a wide range of super wealthy tax and, cheats. And so this isn't about Trump. And, and I, I like the fact that you brought that up because it isn't about Trump. Uh, this mm -hmm. is about this is about the rich people who have hoarded all the money. Now, understand, we were told, you know, Reagan era forward that if we just give the rich people all the money, they'll they're smart. They'll know what to do with it. And they are. And they do. Uh, they make more money for themselves. It never <laughs> trickles down to us. And we know this no. now. So I got two things. One, uh, I thought there was a whistleblower act to protect people like this so that when you have something that is an injustice like this, there is some protection. And two, um, as an average working class person, secrecy is what the employer class, what the wealth class wants. Uh, it's amazing how many people have told me they can't tell their coworker how much they make because the boss might fire them because, well... You might actually know what your neighbor makes to find out what you're worth, and that would be bad for profit. So I just I find this whole situation uh, as a working person just angering that one we would give this guy the maximum sentence, and two we're not holding parades for him. I agree a hundred percent, and like you said, that secrecy only benefits the ruling class. Um, yeah, we should be sharing, you know salary information, tax information, uh, it would help us create a much more level playing field. And yeah, the um, during the prosecution of Little John, um, like I said, I, I mentioned earlier, the judge did not allow him to use that public interest defense. Um, you Why? Know, and I, I'm curious, I, is there a reason? Was there a rationale given? Because it seems to me that knowing how rigged our tax system is to benefit the ultra wealthy might actually be in the common interest of of every tax paying citizen in this country. I think the judge argued that um, and she kind of did make it mostly about Trump. She said it can't be open season on our elected officials like she portrayed this as an attack on the privacy of um, the president. And so I, I obviously don't agree with her argument or the judge's argument because um like like i mentioned just a, a moment ago this was about much more than trump so yeah and you know just before he died uh last summer daniel ellsberg um said that there should be much stronger whistleblower protections we need more whistleblowers because if people could expose wrongdoing earlier we could avoid a lot more um injustices and so the fact that um the federal government for a long time has been making whistleblowing harder and more dangerous, um, which is all the more reason why little, what Little John did was, you know, really heroic. A uh, friend of the show, Bob Lord from Patriotic Millionaires and Institute for Policy Studies, just the other day compared um, Little John's actions to those of Ellsberg. You know, he put it on par with that because he is trying to alert us to this huge problem of, of uh, tax avoidance by the ultra wealthy while we still have a, a small window to do something about it. Um, and it, it really does feel like we're not that long away from not being able to do anything about it. And so, um, you know, I, I guess to go back to why pardon Little John, you know, there's the moral case and then there's the political case. And that is, you know, recently there's been this spate of studies that have come out just detailing the the extent to which the tax code is rigged um, and how Trump made it worse with the, the Trump tax cuts uh, that were passed at the end of 2017. Um, and so the first study I remember recently that came out, uh, ITEP, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, put one out that showed, um, I can't remember the exact figure, but it showed how little corporations have paid uh, in the first five years of the Trump tax cuts, 2018 to 2022. And then IPS came out with another study that showed that um, I have hit here where. Yeah, there are no, there were, I think you said 35 corporations paid their executive Thank you. more than they paid in yes. federal taxes, which is obscene. It is obscene, right? And that kind of shows you like it's a double whammy. So, first of all, uh, billionaires are stealing from us by underpaying workers and overpaying themselves. And then they steal again by not paying their taxes. Um, like that's when we're trying to recuperate some of that, those ill-gotten gains is through taxation and they're avoiding that too. So it's this double whammy. So, but, so all these studies are coming out. In addition, um, the IRS recently said that thanks to the funding boost that was included in the Inflation Reduction Act, they're gonna be able to collect, you know, over $550 billion in taxes that 
the wealthy have normally been avoiding um, just in the next uh, few years, um, thanks to the the beefed up enforcement powers. And um, and that includes, you know, sending letters to it's just so brazen. There's uh, over 125,000 wealthy people that haven't even bothered filing their taxes in the past few years because they can just get away with it. Um, and so notwithstanding all those great studies and, and research, you know, how many average voters are aware of that? And I'm afraid the answer might be not enough. Um, and so one way that I think Biden could make this issue of tax fairness, uh, he could put it at the foreground of the 2024 election is by pardoning Little John. So this is where that political angle comes in, because it's almost certain that if he were to pardon Little John, Trump, Trump would, would lose cry his mind. Foul. Trump would lose, he would his, lose mind. his mind, right? Trump would <laughs> and go I would crazy. do it just for that. That would be the price. That's, <laughs> that's worth the price of admission. But here's the thing. And this is where, you know, we have been trained like Pavlovian dogs to whenever you're talking about taxes that we start foaming at the mouth because, you know, everybody I know gets mad about having to pay taxes. Now, the part that also makes us mad is when someone gets away with not paying them. And this is where the Trump thing was curious to me because a lot of my red hat friends weren't upset by the fact that he was paying a lower tax rate than they were other than uh, he he got them to believe i pay a lot of taxes uh yeah you pay a lot because you have a lot of money uh and this is where this is where you go the big numbers that they pay is because they make an enormous amount of money but as a percentage of their income i think warren buffett said his secretary pays a higher rate than he pays and that's wrong it's class warfare he said and his class is winning but they shouldn't be and i agree with warren on that Amen. Amen. And yeah, I, I agree. It is curious, like when Trump bragged about um, skirting his taxes, why some people thought, oh, yeah, like that makes him smart and savvy. Um, and I think it does speak to, you know, there's just a lot of discontent because of this 40, 50 year one sided class war that workers have been losing. And so I think a lot of people are resentful of of paying taxes and, and especially when they find out that they're paying more than the rich. And so, but that's just all the more reason why we need to um, enact progressive uh, tax reforms um, so that, yeah, you know, Trump can say, I'm paying this big number in taxes, but as you pointed out, it's the percentage that matters. And when billionaires have true tax rates in the single digits, um, that's clearly a huge problem. Yeah. No, as and, I've been uh, saying, look, when when passive income is taxed, is taxed at a lower rate than a person who's going out and freezing their you-know-what's out in the cold to, to string line or, or, or move freight or, you know, people are working on a bridge that ultimately could get hit by a barge and end up being killed at work, when they're paying a higher tax rate than someone who the hardest day's work they do is moving money from one pocket to the other, there is something wrong with your tax code. Uh, when, when gambling on Wall Street is taxed at a lower rate than swinging a hammer or doing hard manual labor, there is something seriously wrong. And this is this is a great issue to rile people up. As long as you're not getting into the weeds of of all of the you know the, this statistic and that, it's not fair. Is the answer exactly? And that's our point. Like what the billionaires in there not paying taxes, what they're doing, that's criminal. What Little John did wasn't really criminal. I mean, he broke a law, but the the true criminals are the tax cheats, the billionaire tax cheats. Um, and See, now this yes. is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop for a second because I don't actually, mm-hmm. I don't want to make it sound like what they're doing is criminal because, well, I, I guess if you would say that they took a bunch of money, they bought, you know, the best democracy money could buy so they could write the laws that benefited them uh, so that when they did take all the money, it didn't look criminal. If you're calling that criminal, then I'm with you. But they have rigged the game sufficiently that we've allowed them to to rig the game to where what they're doing isn't necessarily, quote unquote, illegal as the laws are written, which, again, goes back to that fairness thing that working people have to pick up the slack and pay for these these billionaires. That's true. That's a really good point. Like technically, um, they're what they're doing isn't always illegal on and oftentimes through these accounting gimmicks and you know they they pay these armies of accountants to um use these sophisticated techniques to lower their tax bill um and some of that's legal but i guess i meant like criminal in in the moral sense like who between little john and the jeff bezos of the world um who's in the wrong and 
yeah, like I can't argue um, with you there. <laughs> Cause as I always say, <laughs> like, behind every great billionaire is a great crime. Um, so I'm, I'm with you. I got, I'm, I'm with you on this one. Yeah. Okay. I figured you would be on the same page there. And it's like, um, you know, just going back to the importance of what little John did and that, you know, we have this short window to try to fix it. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, I guess I just want to emphasize all the bad things that come from yeah. the tax avoidance by, by the, the ultra wealthy, you know, the first thing is that, um, it allows for them to concentrate more and more wealth in fewer and fewer hands. And then as you alluded to now, they're in a position to buy lawmakers, to buy judges. And then, you know, the legislative legislative branch and the judiciary ends up further cementing this system that benefits, um, those rich people who are paying, paying, um, for their campaigns or, you know, um, giving them gifts in the case of the courts. And so, um, Man, I mean, stop and, for a second, stop for a second, yeah. just stop and mm -hmm. think about how corrupt our, our system is, you know, just in the sentence that you just blew past, uh, you said it like it didn't even, yeah, it was just another, <laughs> it was, it was just another thing that came after the comma. Uh, you know, our, our courts are bought and paid for. Judges are going on vacations with billionaires, taking gifts, getting RVs, and having their kids sent to private schools. Like it's yeah, just something else that comes after the comma before the end, what's next. That to me is just insanely, mm, I, I guess I can't get past it. You're right. And I I do, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of guilty of like, almost i i wouldn't say that i normalize it like i i think it's outrageous but it has become like this thing that it it almost feels like it's been normalized in our political system but we should not let it be normalized because it is a truly um outrageous um scam so last question i've got for you um mm -hmm. is anything is there is there a movement kenny is there something a website is there is there an, an organization pushing for this pardon is there some some marching orders that you know people can sign a petition can you know don donate a couple of bucks is there something that that or is or or you know is this article the hope that something will spring out of this all that i'm aware of that exists right now is uh there is a fundraiser um uh it's a GoFundMe for Charles's uh, legal defense fund. I can try to pull up the URL if you if you would like, or you can tell your listeners later. Get it to us, uh, and we'll we'll put it out on social okay. media so folks can take a look at it. Um, yeah, let me. So we, what we need um, to do then is we need to get someone to start this. Uh, we need yes. you, know, you need a a, a pardon mm -hmm. little John hashtag. You need you need some some folks to get behind this and push for it because you know ultimately uh, this is something that you think you can organize around. So if there are any industrious yeah. organizers out there, this is this seems like a good cause. I think so. And just could I just um, add a little bit more about why this would be politically beneficial, I think, for Biden? Because as you, as you pointed out, like not everyone's going to get into the weeds with the wonky analyses and the statistics. But Trump, through his own reaction to a pardon, would make sure that this issue stays in the news cycle for an extended period of time. And it would be a huge spectacle if Trump claim to be the victim of this, you know, of, of little John's quote unquote crime. Um, when in reality, all of us ordinary working Americans are the victims of billionaire malfeasance. And so I think that that would really help Biden. And, you know, one really good thing about this issue is that it's one of the, uh, a handful of issues where there's still a lot of cross-partisan agreement that we need to be taxing the rich more and corporations and people are really pissed off that um teachers and nurses are paying more in taxes than billionaire executives and so you know biden stands to gain from keeping and from making tax fairness a huge pillar of the 2024 campaign because you know trump and the republicans in congress they want to extend the tr trump tax cuts that right. have already cost us trillions no, you're, you're spot on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, when when this gets fired up, I want to hear more about it. Uh, but good stuff, Kenny. I appreciate it. I hope folks will take a look at the article over at Slate.com. Uh, it's why Biden should pardon the IRS whistleblower who leaked Trump's taxes. We'll get links out on social media. Kenny Stansel, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for having me. Uh, good stuff. I want to hear your thoughts. Should we be? Should we pardon this guy? Uh, I, I think so. Look, yeah, we've done, we've done, we've done less. Um, 
But the fact that he he was the guy who raised the awareness of just how much these 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 guys are getting away with, I think it's well worth it. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Quick break, right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1948. That was the day that the labor movement came literally to the doorstep of Wall Street. The United Financial Employees Union went out on strike. The union was started in 1941 by Merritt David Keefe, a page who had worked on the stock exchange trading floor. Keefe had grown up too poor to finish high school. He had gone to Wall Street in the hope of finding wealth and financial security. Instead, he found long hours and low-paying work. He decided the only way to change things was to form a union. By 1946, the union had grown to 5,000 members. Keefe described their platform, calling for a general overall minimum increase of 25% in the salaries of Wall Street employees, job security, benefits of a pension fund, and, in addition, a bonus computed on the volume of trading. Negotiations drug on. Finally, 1,100 union members walked out on strike against both the New York Stock Exchange and the New York Curb Exchange. 500 members of the Seafarers Union supported the exchange workers' cause. The first day of the strike was peaceful, but the next morning, the police told the strikers they could not picket the main entrance of the stock exchange. One 19-year-old woman refused to go across the street. The police reacted by grabbing her and arresting her. Outraged, the picketers rushed to her aid. Some attempted to lie down in the entrance to block the exchange. The police wielded batons, hospitalizing two strikers and arresting more than 40. Sadly, the strike ended in defeat in April, as 100 workers lost their jobs because of their involvement. The workers had lost the Battle of Wall Street, the first and only strike at the exchange. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So are you surprised that this uh, Charles Little John gets five years while, oh, I don't know, Weaselberg gets a couple of months? Uh, and the answer is no. Look, uh, there was another story in Georgia that caught my attention. Uh, a guy named Brian Pritchard, um, you know, mega Republican, uh, vice chair of the Republican Party of Georgia, um, a guy who was all in, you know, the, the, the election stolen. People are voting fraudulently. You know, there's all of this, you know, all of this crime going on. They're stealing the election. Uh, also, did I mention he's a conservative talk show host? So again, the bloviating on how illegal uh, people were voting and how all this this fraud was happening, only to find out. And again, this is, I was having this conversation about why people were going after Trump. It's, it's that thing where when you put the spotlight on yourself and you go, hey, I'm, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and no one would come after me. I can do all of this stuff and no one will call, make me accountable. You're basically saying, hey, come get me. Well, Pritchard, the conservative talk show host, uh, you know, claimer of fraudulent elections, turns out <laughs> on Wednesday, a judge in Georgia ruled that the Vice chair, the first vice chair of the Georgia Republican Party, well, he voted illegally nine times. Turns out, um, was on probation from a forgery charge in Pennsylvania. You know, good upstanding citizen, law-abiding citizen. And then, you know, went and, and registered to vote and then voted nine times. Um. $5,000 fine. Uh, evidently, the judge also ordered that he receive a public reprimand from the state elections board. So basically a slap on the wrist and a small little fine and go on your way. Uh, and you know, that would be all fine, well, and good, maybe if it weren't so deplorable. Now, you 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 compare that uh, to a black woman, Crystal Mason, who evidently on the advice of a poll worker, 
she said, hey, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm registered, or if, I'm, if I'm able to vote, uh, you know, laid out her situation. Uh, the poll worker said, well, well, you know what? File a provisional ballot and, and you know, see what there, we'll go from there. Uh, now, understand, the ballot was never counted. Never counted. And she got five years in jail. One hand, you got slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. Promise you won't. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sorry, black woman, five years in prison. Let that sink in for a minute. Five years in prison for doing something not even, I would argue, wrong. Took the advice of the poll worker, filed the provisional ballot, didn't try to cast a ballot you know, by pulling the lever. But this guy nine times? Fraudulent, illegally voted? Slap on the wrist? Tell me there's not a double standard in our justice system. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick, at the ricksmithshow.com. As always, if you miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast. Wherever you get your favorite podcast, you'll find ours. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.